Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Zeenat Iqbal from Department of Pharmaceutics, a Faculty of Pharmacy. Today we are going to talk on the module Parental Control Drug Delivery System, a brief introduction of the same and also its basic understanding. This is from the paper NDDS1. So students, let us try to understand what are the things which we are focusing on in this module. After the introduction, or rather in the introduction, we would try to understand the need for the parenteral. So we look for a question, answer to this question of by parenteral route of administration. We will also try to highlight the shortcomings or the demerits of the conventional delivery of a parenteral dosage forms. Because there are certain limitations to the conventional delivery of parenteral dosage forms, then only we require something like as referred to as parenteral control drug delivery system. After we are able to understand the demerits, we will try to find out that what are the objectives of the parenteral control drug delivery. The next section of the module would also focus on the various polymers which enable us to make the controlled delivery possible through this route. We will also spend time on finding out the various ideal properties of the parenteral control drug delivery systems as such. The latter part of the module will focus on the advantages of parenteral control drug delivery system its associated disadvantages. We would also like to discuss certain approaches for the development of parenteral control release formulations and we would spend a little time on understanding the biopharmaceutical behavior of the parenteral control drug delivery systems. Parenteral drug delivery administration is one of the oldest type of drug delivery administration system. Of course, it is not the first choice because the first choice with a patient will always remain the oral ingestion. The question then arises that when and why should we choose a parenteral system? This system is chosen because of certain very specific reasons. The first thing which is to be appreciated is the system ascertains that the drug will reach the categorical target areas of the body via the blood and the lymphatic systems. So we are just simply pumping in the drug into the blood and we are sure that it should reach where we want it to reach. It sanctions the researcher to have a control over pharmacological parameters tissue concentrations, serum levels, elimination of the drug from the body and the other related factors. Parenteral products primarily are sterile dosage forms that are injected into the body tissues via intramuscular which we commonly refer to as the IM route, intravenous called as the IV route and subcutaneous which is called as your SC route. Parenteral treatment was initially recorded as infusion of the medications into the veins of living creatures in around 1657 AD. This delivery is the most widely recognized and proficient for delivery of active drug substances which have got poor bioaccessibility and which has got a very narrow therapeutic index. It must be definitely for the purpose of the safety of the patient, has to be exceptionally pure and free from physical, chemical and biological contaminants. If we try to understand the major routes of parental administration, the diagram in front of your screens probably tells you very clearly that the commonest of these routes are referred to as the intravenous route, the intramuscular route and the subcutaneous route of parenteral administration. As just mentioned, we have got the three major routes of administration of drug through the parenteral drug delivery systems. Amongst them, the first one is the intravenous route. It's absolutely understandable that in the absence of the barrier to the absorption, the intravenous route proves to be the most rapid onset action giving route and as compared to any other parenteral route, it results in complete absorption of drug by the body. 
drugs that are too irritating for the intramuscular or subcutaneous administration. Example, the various chemotherapeutic agents can also be given by this route. Controlled delivery carriers, which can be given by this route, include liposomes, nanoparticles, erythrocytes, and polypeptides. Numerous studies have proven that the distribution of the dosage form depends upon the particle size. The particle size, if it is more than 1 micrometers, gets entrapped in the lung, whereas particles having size between 0.1 to 0.7 micrometers are taken up by the liver or spleen and small particles less than 0.1 gets deposited in the bone marrow. The next route probably which is of interest to us is the intramuscular route. This route of administration is usually considered less hazardous and easier to administer than as compared to the intravenous route. The onset of action is typically between the intravenous administration and the subcutaneous administration. However, patients have been known to experience more pain via the intramuscular administration than via the intravenous administration. The best site for intramuscular injections are the deltoid, gluteal and the vastus lateralis that is the thigh muscles. Thus needles used for the injections are usually between 1 to 1.5 inches long and are generally 19 to 22 gauze in size. The volume should not exceed 2 ml. A slightly soluble form of the drug serves as a drug resource, generating the desired form of the drug release. The next route for parenteral administration, which is very commonly used, is the subcutaneous route. It is one of the most versatile routes of drug administration used for both long-term and short-term therapies. The maximum amount of dosage that can be injected via subcutaneous route is about 2 ml. Needles are generally 3 by 8 to 1 inch in length and the gauze is between 24 to 27. Subcutaneous route has been widely used for the administration of insulin. The drug is usually injected or the device is implanted beneath the surface of the skin of the upper arm the anterior surface of the thigh or the lower portion of the abdomen. The upper back also can be used as a site of subcutaneous injection. The site of administration is usually rotated when injections are to be frequently given. Let us now focus on the ideal characteristics of any parenteral formulation. The first and the foremost characteristics or the attribute is it should of course be safe from accidental drug release, should be simple to administer and remove, should be mechanically strong, should be inert, physiologically biocompatible, must be comfortable to the patient, should be capable of achieving high drug loading and high entrapment in case we are going to use the particulate system of delivery should be readily processable that means it should be easy to be manufacturing and should be easy easily suited for the scale up must be sterile it has to be free from pyrogen and any foreign material it should be free from particulate material it has to be absolutely clear must be stable throughout the administration ideally it should be isotonic therefore there is there should not be any presence of the stingy feeling or there should not be any irritation the moment it is given inside the body it should not probably result in any type of reactions or hypersensitive reactions the solvents or vehicles which are used in making such formulations they should meet standards of high special purity and other prescribed standards for the same there has to be probably restricted use of a particular category of buffers only, stabilizer should be in a grass category, antimicrobial preservatives should be of a particular restricted category or a regulated category. Without any doubts, it has to be well understood that it should not contain any coloring agent. 
it must be prepared under aseptic conditions. So, it is well understood. It has to be sterile while it is to be packaged. It has to be sterile while it is being taken care of to the patients. It has, it reaches the patient and while it is being formulated, there is no doubt about the fact that it has to be prepared under the aseptic conditions. Then coming to the last part, once it is formulated, the packaging should not be compromised. The packaging of the parentals have to be absolutely specific and of course of very high quality. My dear students, we just submitted the various types of advantages and merits which are being offered by the parental root administration of dosage forms. But keeping in view the conventional parental delivery, they are also associated with a large number of demerits. These demerits can be understood as number one, the parental route usually offers a rapid onset of action, but which is also associated with the rapid decline in the systemic drug level. The other important thing to remember is that it requires a frequent injection, which ultimately causes a large amount of patient discomfort. The drug may also be something like which is rapidly metabolized in the liver or other organs. The drug may be removed rapidly from the body through the kidney. A continuous injection may be required to maintain the therapeutically effective concentration which again is probably cost intensive and not very much patient compliant because it will essentially lead to hospitalization and probably it ultimately leads to a lot of money on the part of expenditure of a patient who is undergoing this type of therapy. It has been just spelt out that the conventional parental drug delivery systems will be having certain very specific advantages but they are also associated with a large number of disadvantages. So, what is the option? If we need to have a parental system, can we do some changes so that it becomes more patient compliant and it overcomes some of the caveat associated? An attempt on this specific issue has led to the development of various types of parental controlled drug delivery system. The word or the term controlled release implies that the drug delivery system can provide some control whether this is of a temporal or a spatial nature or both of the drug release in the body. In other words, the system tries to control the drug concentration in the target tissue or cells. The parental Control release formulation has the capability of to regulate the systemic or local availability of a drug which may then hugely modify the efficacy or safety of that particular drug candidate. In case the drug has a short half-life, a modified release system can prolong the drug exposure after a single injection. Thus, by increasing the exposure time of the drug, these systems significantly lower the frequency of injections. PCDDS or Parental Control Drug Delivery System also has the capacity to administer high doses of drug with a lower maximum serum concentration than a bolus injection. In some situations, the Cmax or the maximum concent plasma concentration from the controlled release preparation may be lower than that achieved with a more frequent bolus drug. Parenterally administered controlled drug delivery system can be of various types. These could be microspheres, injectable gels, implants, liposomes, neosomes, nanoemulsions, nanoparticulate systems which could then be solid lipid nanoparticles, NLCs which could be polymeric and non-polymeric. These systems change the release profile of the entrapped drug as they circulate throughout the body or accumulate at a specific targeted system of action. 
the accumulation of doxorubicin liposome in solid tumor in a well observed studies tells us very clearly that how the drug doxorubicin was of much better consequence when given in the form of the liposomal and administered through the parenteral route similarly pegylated liposomes could be protected from the serum protein binding and phagocytic recognition which provided a longer circulating half life than the regular liposomes the table in front of you is primarily giving us an idea about the classification of the parenteral which are control drug delivery focused we can have pure injectables which can be either the solutions suspensions emulsions microspheres microcapsules nanoparticles neosomes liposomes resealed erythrocytes and many more whereas the second class can exclusively consists of the implant systems then we have a more sophisticated designed systems which are called as the infused devices or infusion devices these include for example the osmotic pumps the vapor pressure powered pumps intraspinal infusion pumps and intrathecal infusion pumps the names of the last few in themselves are clear enough to tell us the site of the infusion and perhaps the means and ways by which it can be used for the better controlled parenteral delivery with the background in mind that what are the various ways by which the parenteral administration can be done we would now like to focus on that what are the various goals of the parenteral controlled drug delivery system one of the first primary goals appears to be to make the drug reach the target cells or the target tissue and hence we can say that it is aimed at the site specific delivery the second primary goal is to ensure minimal drug loss during the transit to the target similarly it is aimed at diminished side effects and also is an attempt for increased bioavailability where the drug release at the target site for the desired period is there and it usually shows a sustained effect it also will help the to deliver the drug to the appropriate intracellular target site and of course by focusing on all these goals the major target remains that we want an increased therapeutic efficacy let us now try to summar sum up or summarize the ideal properties of the parenteral controlled drug delivery system for any drug delivery system we usually ideate a particular level of formulation design and its behavior what are the various things which we attach with an ideal drug delivery systems which is being used parenterally the first thing which comes to the mind is that it should be safe from accidental drug release number 2 should be simple to administer and eliminate next it should be mechanically strong should be unreactive of course it has to be physiologically biocompatible the comfort level of the patient should not be compromised it should be as much comfortable as possible should be capable of achieving high drug loading and high entrapment should be readily processable that means it is not very difficult to be processed and formulated has to be must be sterile then should be free from pyrogen and any foreign material should be ideally completely free from particulate matter must have clarity must have stability throughout the administration and of course must be isotonic the solvents or vehicles which are used must specially be purified and should match all the other standards stabilizers buffers antimicrobial preservatives should be used in the acceptable limits only and there should not be any use of any type of coloring agents it must be prepared 
under the sterile conditions and it must have specific and high quality packaging in order to maintain its authenticity, purity, safety and efficacy till it is being consumed by the consumer or the patient. My dear students, let us now try to focus on the various specific advantages which are offered by the parental control delivery systems. The first and the foremost advantage which probably is of course the most important as well is an improved patient convenience and compliance. Because of the sheer it's being a control delivery system there is a drastic reduction in the fluctuations in the steady state levels. There is an increased safety margin of high potency drugs. The maximum utilization of the drug happens this is another very major advantage. If I may say it this way, because of the sheer control delivery uh, protocol, it actually re reduces the healthcare cost through improved therapy, shorter treatment period, and less frequency of dosing. It avoids the peak, that is the risk of toxicity at troughs, that is the risk of ineffectiveness of the conventional therapy. I think we all uh, as pharmaceutical people understand the formation of the peak in the trough, the peak in the trough in a conventional system. So it avoids the ri rising in that toxicity peak and it also avoids the ineffectiveness. So it has got something which we refer to as the steady state of drug delivery. Then it reduces the dosing frequency, ultimately that has to, that will add to the patient compliance. It is definitely an improved drug delivery and it offers some sort of flexibility as far as the drug delivery is concerned. We continue to understand the disadvantages. There has to be always a flip side to any system and then the parental control delivery system is no exception. It has got a series of disadvantages. The first disadvantage is it decreases the systemic availability due to slow release of the drug from the formulation. It has got a little bit of poor in vitro in vivo correlation. There could be a possibility of dose dumping because there can be the drug which is not released as far as uh, because most of the time when we talk of the control system the release of the drug is not 100% the way we predicted. So there could be a possibility of dose dumping. Retrieval of the drug is difficult in case of toxicity poisoning or hypersensitivity reactions. When it is there in the body, it is there in the body. So we'll have to actually go in for some other mechanisms of doing the damage control. Reduced potential for dosage adjustments. It is little rigid here. We can't do any types of flexibility in case of dosage adjustments. And there is no doubt about the fact that because it is a research product, a lot of money goes into it. So ultimately, the cost of formulations are very, very high. Then needless to say, it is invasive. So that adds to one of the disadvantages. There could be a danger of device failure. You had designed it for a particular target. It doesn't do what it had to do. And then probably its use is limited to only potent drugs. So the spectrum of the drug usage is drastically reduced and there are certain associated commercial disadvantages. After understanding the various ideal properties which are intended to be found in the parental control release systems, let us just go ahead and try to find out that what are the various approaches which can be ideally used for the development of parental controlled release of formulations. There could be many beginning from the plain use of the change of solvent to the specialized formulation designs. If we try to sum them up, the first one can be a simple approach wherein we can use the viscous water miscible vehicles. Example could be an aqueous solution of gelatin. The second simple approach could be using the water insoluble vehicles like your vegetable oils along with excipients like aluminium monostearate. We can go to a little slightly complex system which is probably the development of the thixotropic suspensions. 
The other formulation approaches which can be present there are the development of water insoluble derivatives like the salts, complexes and esters of a particular drug and then being used as a controlled release formulation. And finally, the most sophisticated of the approaches is the development of the polymeric microspheres, nanospheres, microcapsules, nanocapsules from the polymers which ought to be biodegradable and biocompatible exemplified by the commonest of the lactide glycolide homopolymers or its copolymers. Biopharmaceutics of the parenteral controlled drug delivery system. Ideally, in such a system usage, a depot is formed when the controlled parenteral formulation is administered into a tissue space, muscle or adipose tissue. After being resting there, it then releases the drug from the probable dosage form into the circulation and then into the area of action before the drug can get into the therapeutic mode. The probable event is in front of your screens wherein probably you can appreciate that the release of the drug is primarily affected by the partition step, the dissolution and then it is affected and finally probably is influenced by a large number of physiochemical attributes of the drug and carriers. The drug has to go through all these rigors of getting partitioned, absorbed, entering into the general circulation, also to the other parts of circulation and then reach the target site where the designated action is to be taking place, has to take place. It is now being impressed upon that a parenteral controlled drug delivery system primarily on the usage of certain carrier systems which could be either microspheres, microcapsules, nanospheres, nanocapsules or many other variety of carriers. Therefore, it is important for us to understand that what should be the desirable ideal properties of such parenteral drug carriers. Let us try to evaluate each one of them one after the other. The first and the foremost desirable characteristic or property of the parenteral drug carrier is its being versatile. The versatility in this context means that this type of a carrier which is designed should be amenable to be used as a platform carrier for delivery of variety of agents. It should also be having the properties of high loading capacity so that it can carry a sufficient amount of drug to release the therapeutic concentrations at the target location. It must be able to be limiting the drug distribution to the expected target tissue, uniform distribution within the capillary vasculature of the target tissue should be ensured minimizing systemic drug release during intravascular transit should be there. It should be able to be protecting the drug from the inactivation by the plasma enzymes. Should definitely be biocompatible and minimally antigenic if at all. And it should be capable of undergoing biological degradation with prompt elimination and minimal toxicity of the breakdown products. After understanding the various properties of the parenteral drug carriers, it is now imminent for us to understand the various parameters which would eventually affect the formulation development. There are a variety of sets of the parameters which will be affecting the formulation development. We will start with the very first one which probably is the effect of physiochemical properties. The first is the presence of other ingredients in the formulation and their interaction. The second property is the solubility of the drug in the biological fluids, the capacity of the drug to partition into the tissue fluid, lipophilicity of the drug, pKa value of the drug, pH value of the formulation, particle size and crystalline habit of drug solids, 
rate of dissolution of drug solids in the formulation vehicle. All these parameters which have just been mentioned will directly have an effect on the onset time, intensity and the duration of a therapeutic response of a drug delivered by parenteral controlled release formulation. The effect of the particle size on the dissolution of the drug solids can also be related to the prolonged drug release. This can be achieved by increasing the particle size of drug solids in the formulation, which can also be referred to as the macrocrystal principle. It has been proven that greater the particle size, more sustained will be the serum drug level and the longer will be the duration of biological activity. Changing the solubility of the formulation can increase or decrease the rate of dissolution. Example, in case of polymorphism, the polymorph with higher solubility has a faster rate of dissolution and hence rapid absorption. For weakly acidic or weakly basic drugs, drug molecules can exist in either an ionized or an unionized form. And the degree of ionization depends upon the dissociation constant of the drug and the pH of the medium. As per the Henderson Hasselbalch equation, for the acid drugs in the medium with pH values below the pK of the drug molecules, would exist predominantly as an unionized form and this unionized form is invariably the absorbable form of the drug. On the other hand, the basic drug exists in the ionized form. The solubility of these drugs can be changed by altering the pH of the vehicle which causes an increase or decrease in the dissolution rate in the hydrodynamic diffusion layer as well as extent of partitioning of the drug molecules from the formulations to the tissue fluids at the injection site. The viscosity of the suspension on the other hand can also affect the rate of dissolution by changing the diffusivity of the drug molecule in the vehicle. For example, the use of an aqueous solution having 35% volume by volume glycerine as the vehicle decreased the acute subcutaneous toxicity of isoniazid and streptomycin sulfate. Certain suspensions show thixotropic behavior. That is, when a suspension is stirred very gently or left standing for some time, they show a nearly infinite viscosity but become fluidier in their consistency and flow rather more readily when shaken. The thixotropic suspension therefore has the advantage that as the drug reaches the injection site in the muscle tissue, the suspension structure regenerates and a compact depot results whereas when shaken before injection it becomes fluid enough to pass through the hypodermic needle. What we have probably tried to understand are the various physiochemical properties of the drug and the drug formulation which will have a direct impact upon the drug delivery behavior from the parenteral control drug delivery system. In the just preceding section, we had tried to understand that what are the drug related properties which we eventually will have a direct bearing on the behavior of the parenteral control drug delivery system. We would now in this succeeding section try to understand the effect of the physiological conditions on the behavior of the parenteral control drug delivery. Enhancement in the muscular activity which produces an increase in blood flow to the muscles may yield an increase in the rate of drug absorption from the injection site. The criteria therefore has to be assessed in order to determine the route and the site of the parenteral drug administration.
the various parameters which need to be understood before deciding the drug site and finding out the effect of the physiological conditions are as follows. The first one is desired rate and extent of systemic absorption. It has to be totally understood that what is the intention of delivering that parenteral controlled formulation and what is the rate and extent to which the formulation is expected to deliver the drug. The patient disease state will be the best determinant of this type of behavior and choice of the drug delivery system. The second important criteria which would be able to help us to decide the site of parenteral drug administration is the total volume of the formulation which needs to be administered. For example, subcutaneously you cannot go beyond 1 to 2 ml of the dosage form whereas in case of the IV formulation depending upon the urgency and emergency conditions the IV route can be completely used for a delivery of large volumes of parenteral formulations. The dosing frequency would be the next important determinant. Similarly, the inherent irritation, acidity, basicity and or concentration would be the other determinants. The extent of local tissue irritation, nerve damage and inadvertent blood vessel entry can also be an important parameter to be assessed while delivering the drug through the parental route. Of course, last but not least, the age and the physical condition of the patient would primarily decide the route of administration while delivering the parental control drug delivery system. My dear students, we have now reached to the end of the module discussions. What we had learned in this module primarily focused on answering the first major question that why we should actually use the parental drug delivery system. We probably answered this question successfully that it has got certain various important advantages and there are certain situations where we actually need the parental delivery so that the drug categorically reaches to the target site and gives us a rapid onset of action. We also appreciated the various types of routes of administration where we had probably highlighted more on the IV, IM and the subcutaneous route. Then we probably juxtapose the conventional parenteral drug delivery systems with the control release parenteral drug delivery systems. There are certain disadvantages, demerits of the conventional parenteral systems, then probably those are overcome. And one of the major thing which we are capable of overcoming is that the parenteral control drug delivery system focuses on giving us the steady type of drug delivery. It probably also has an added advantage that we can probably reduce the cost of healthcare. We also focused on this module about the various polymers which we can successfully use for the controlling of the drug delivery through the parenteral route. We spent little time on the ideal properties of the parenteral control drug delivery systems. Towards the end, we were able to appreciate the cogent and specific advantages of the parenteral control drug delivery. We also highlighted the disadvantages of parenteral control drug delivery and we spent a lot of time on understanding the various approaches which are used for the development of controlled release formulations. Under this, we probably highlighted the properties which are formulation related and the properties which are physiology related. So in conclusion, we can say that if you want to make a successful controlled type of parental drug delivery system then we have to have an understanding of the formulation aspects like the solubility, partition coefficient, lipophilicity, hydrophilicity of the drug molecule 
also we should have to choose the various polymers and the excipients which can probably give us the real control and then we cannot negate the presence of the physiological conditions. When as a formulation scientist we are able to appreciate these three aspects then we can probably think of making a parenteral drug delivery system which is of the topmost design and which is something which will be patient compliant and can be successfully used in various ailments.